Dolly the sheep was the first mammal cloned from a different animal's adult cell. She was created by using a process called somatic cell nuclear transfer, or SCNT, when the nucleus of an unfertilized egg is replaced with the nucleus of an adult cell, such as a mammary gland cell, which is how Dolly got her name, from the famous country singer Dolly Parton, known for her mammary glands, I guess. Whose idea was this? Before Dolly's birth, cloning from adult cells was only theory and demonstrating that it actually could be done rewrote many things we had previously thought. Eggs have only one set of genes. They get the second set needed to develop into an embryo during fertilization. It turned out that this process can be triggered by giving the egg a readily available set from a different cell, fusing them with a little electric snap and the process will happen largely the same way. With a much higher failure rate though, Dolly was the only embryo that developed fully out of 277. Her existence was announced to the world on the 22nd of February in 1997 when she was around seven months old, followed by a huge media frenzy. It's still an ongoing debate whether her genetic age matched her real age, Analysis showed that her genetic age was indeed older by some standards, but all physiological tests showed she was a healthy young sheep, except for developing arthritis at only four years old. That could have also been a result of her living a sheltered life with not much activity, frequent struts on concrete floors for photographers, and not necessarily premature aging. She lived six years in total. She died in 2003 after getting lung cancer from a virus that's known to cause this illness in sheep. There are so many things to talk about when it comes to cloning. Real clones, history, actual science and misconceptions, how it's generally presented in movies and media, the ethics. Oh, the ethics. The title of this video is not clickbait. A massive scandal around human cloning that shook the entire world and left those with spinal cord injuries feeling betrayed. Cloning humans is the main focus of pop culture. Most media involving cloning tends to work with the idea of cloning humans, not all of it. Obviously, Jurassic Park is also based on it. The clones in movies are most often identical copies of the person, which would be very unlikely with our current knowledge. But honestly, who knows? Maybe it could happen someday, creating someone who's identical to you on every level, knows all your feelings, thoughts, shares all your quirks. <laughs> Fuck no. Yeah. Hot pass. So, cloning. Scientifically, the concept of a clone is basically an organism that shares identical DNA with another organism. And that's basically it. A pile of bacteria that started from a single cell, identical twins, these plants, all clones in a way. It sounds like stuff from science fiction, but in reality clones are quite common in nature. The word itself originates from the Greek word klon, which means slip or twig. But I know you're not here because of plants, you're here because you want to hear about the horrors of cloning, identical people groaning tubes and stuff. And we'll get to that, the times those kinds of clones appear in fiction, but first I must burst your bubble and tell you how relatively boring clones are in nature compared to that. If you're able to keep plants alive, then you've likely seen some like these. I cut them by cutting some leaves from a bigger one at work and putting them in water until they grew roots. They are genetically the same clones of both the one I got their original leaves from and of each other. Lots of plants we eat are cultivated this way. We find one we really like, we want to have more exactly like it, so we make clones, like bananas that are all the clones of one single banana plant from way back and it's only a matter of time until they go extinct. Again! That's right, it already happened once! The Gros Michel banana, which was the most popular kind back in the days, went extinct in the 80s and the same disease is threatening the Cavendish. Any organism capable of asexual reproduction basically produces clones of itself. 
Parthenogenesis is the process when a female of a species produces offspring without a male, and animals capable of both sexual and asexual reproduction tend to choose based on environmental factors. With parthenogenesis, a population can multiply in a very short amount of time if there are, say, no males present, which is helpful if they need to multiply their numbers very quickly in order to survive. But it's not always the best way to go about these things. Let's imagine that you have a debilitating peanut allergy. Studies show that allergies are largely hereditary, so if you decided to create clones of yourself and fill up an entire town with them, all the residents would likely have the same peanut allergy. This could easily wipe out all of you. And that's a threat. Sexual reproduction ensures that a mixture of genes is present in a population. If an allergen or a pathogen appeared, it would be a lot more unlikely that the entire population would be wiped out due to that single thing. Animals that can switch between the two will most times opt for sexual reproduction because that ensures a genetically diverse population with better chances of survival. But nature is amazing, so obviously there are exceptions. Whiptail lizards are all female and reproduce strictly by parthenogenesis with a twist. Not only they don't have any males, the offspring will also be genetically different to the mother. On top of this, these all-female lizards also perform traditional mating rituals that trigger their ovulation. Just a bunch of happy lizard roommates in the deserts of Mexico. God, they were roommates. With clones, you can multiply a population very quickly, but it could go away just as fast. Let's back up a little bit and talk about the ways cloning happens, most often in laboratories, so you're not panicking and falling for dumb shit when you hear about cloning experiments. It's the nightmare of most molecular scientists. Ask any and watch their expression turn to pain. So as I already mentioned, cloning means producing an organism that shares identical DNA with another organism. Some bacteria have these tiny ring-like DNA pieces called plasmids that can replicate the same way. They usually contain one or very few genes. They use these most often to gain new abilities quickly, such as resistance to some antibiotics, and can also pass these around among themselves. What if we took these drinks, swapped the gene to another one, put them back in the bacteria, we could in theory produce something we want, right? Like insulin, for example? The way we've been making it for many years now? So basically more than 90% of the time you hear about cloning in science, it's this, cloning pieces of DNA we want more of into bacteria. And it's a very high skill process with numerous vulnerable points, so it can fail incredibly often and cost you months of your precious limited time to do your research. It's very rarely the Dolly kind of cloning. Kind of anticlimactic, I know. Still, is it accurate to say that Dolly was identical to her donor? Kind of. Let's look at a different clone who was created the same way. This jelly bean is CC short for copycat. She's the clone of Rainbow. Do they look identical to you? Many things, including the pattern and color of a cat's coat, are only partially determined by genetics. They are influenced by environmental factors, such as the environment within the womb. Calico cats, like Rainbow, are all female. The red and the tabby or black coat colors are both X-linked, meaning they would need two X chromosomes with different color genes to present both. Male calicos exist, but they are intersex and sterile. If you have two Xs, during development one is randomly inactivated. Where you see the tabby patches, the X containing the red gene was inactivated, and vice versa. The white patches are due to another gene that makes those patches not pigmented at all. Identical twins, who share the entirety of their DNA, are slightly different to each other because they are influenced by slightly different things during their development. Not to mention only about 99% of the DNA is stored inside the nucleus, the rest is in the mitochondria, which you get from your mother, and there's no way to swap those two. Let's get back on track. So let's say you decide that you do want to create a small town of clones who are identical down to your peanut allergy. 
Who am I to judge? What would we need to ensure they are entirely identical to you? First of all, all of the DNA needs to be the same, of course, both the nucleus and the mitochondria. This is no easy task. Mitochondria are very small and there are a bunch of them, so our best bet would be taking your, your siblings or your mother's eggs and putting a nucleus from an adult cell inside. Next, we'd have to fix all the mutations you've acquired all throughout your life. Next up, we should find out the exact environment and factors that influenced your development while you were in the womb and somehow replicate that. Same goes for environmental factors that influence you all throughout your life and making sure your clones live through the same things that would affect their appearance and physiology. The reality of cloning appears to be several things. A lot more natural, a lot more fascinating, a lot more boring and a lot more complicated than the movies make it seem. Do you want to live long? Do you feel the inevitable ever-tightening cold grip of death? Do you feel a general disdain for all life, except for yours, of course? Do you have a fortune at your disposal? If you answered yes to all my questions, you're in luck! My company offers the solution for you. I'm Alex. This is my clone, Valex. My company specializes in copying people for your needs. Heart failure! No problem! Too much parting in your youth and your kidneys resemble less a plump bean and more a prune? Have at it! Leukemia! Just slurp that juicy bone marrow out! Don't worry about it! Our clones are available for any of your organ transplant needs. What? There is no danger of your immune system attacking the new organ because it's completely identical to yours. Order yours today for only 30 small payments of $599,000. And don't worry about Valex. They all learn to accept their fates eventually. A world with lots of identical people with identical roles in a strict society. Dinosaurs roaming around in a field resembling the Jurassic. Clones scattered around in North America due to a belief that cloning can direct human evolution. A certain German physician working to clone a certain German dictator. The young girl clone slash daughter of an old man with fantasy metal bones. A cyberpunk dystopia with clone servants used as objects and sheltered from anything that could make them feel even remotely human. People diagnosed with terminal illnesses getting clones to replace them. The Chinese clone of Donald Trump battling an alien species called the Illuminati. Themes that appear over and over again in media usually represent genuine concerns the general public has around a given topic, and since cloning is a fascinating concept, it appears all over the place. The underlying theme is usually something we've seen a lot. The morality of creating living beings, especially people. This has been a debate ever since the ages of alchemists and interestingly so much of the discussion reaches for a kind of religious justification on why it feels wrong. Scientists playing God. It's not natural. Frankenstein's monster. But here we don't like to settle for feelings, we look deeper into them until we find the root cause. The end result of the story is often pretty similar. Things going wrong, signaling it was a bad idea all along, which is fine, I guess, but I feel like that serves as a proxy for that discussion. One of the earliest mentions of cloning, not by this name though, appeared in Huxley's Brave New World in 1932. In this society, people all operate as cogs in a well-oiled machine, never breaking down, conditioned to never want more or less than they were created to. Cloning, here called Bukanovsky's process, a science fiction term that means splitting a single egg producing 96 identical humans. People in Huxley's world all serve a specific role designated to them since before they are born, so just making more with limited resources like eggs is great. They are not supposed to have personalities anyway. Humans are weird. We're social creatures, find comfort in not being alone, and yet we want to be unlike anyone else. A society populated by groups of identical people with no personalities plays to this feeling like no other. Technology took away everything that would make them human. People control down to the last fiber of their being. And this is what comes up all the time, no matter the story. Control. Controlling nature, history, time, 
deaf people. Gaining influence over something we normally can't control by means you probably shouldn't use. You could clone an extinct species and bring it back from disappearance and risk fucking everything up around them. The extinction is a highly debated concept and there's no general consensus on it at the moment. In the most straightforward way, it means bringing an extinct species back on our terms. The main issue here is that animals appear and disappear naturally. In a healthy ecosystem, things change over time, especially when talking about thousands of years in length. A species doesn't exist outside of the context of their environment, they exist within it. Sometimes that change means there's no room for them anymore, sadly. Bringing a species back would mean taking them out of their context, putting them in a new one we created and hoping for the best. Best case scenario, it works out. Worst case, they fuck everything up around them, making the environment they've been put in uninhabitable for anything else, just like any invasive species would do, which is a considerable risk and a pretty good argument against the whole thing, in my opinion. Bringing a species back from disappearance at the cost of potentially causing several others to disappear is not a good trade-off. Jurassic Park is environmentalist propaganda, actually. There's also the argument that if humans cause a species to disappear, we should fix our mistake and bring them back, but still that would mean nothing without restoring their environment. We usually make them go extinct because we don't allow them to exist in their spaces and not because we hunt them down. So I think we should focus on preservation and not restoration. There's a more human-centric and worrying issue here as well. If someone decided that certain traits are desirable and others not desirable in a society, get a style and clone a few perfect specimens, scatter them around the globe in hopes that they'll eventually pass on their perfect genes and direct human evolution, we'd have the premise of orphan black. Evolution happens by chance. Suppose you decided that it would be a better idea to not clone the woolly mammoth, but drop a couple elephants in Siberia in hopes that their children would be born with curly fur all over their bodies. You'd be severely disappointed when you visit them a week later and find them all dead. See, this wouldn't happen if you just cloned them. And with this, we're getting closer to forcing a long-term influence over something. And you know, historic events don't exist in a vacuum. Certain individuals have more influence on them than others. If they didn't exist, things would have probably happened differently. We can look at this from a wider angle, influencing personal histories, what happens to people, what they experience. Imagine you're dying of an incurable illness and you want to get a clone of yourself so your loved ones won't have to experience losing you. With this act, you're influencing their future. Their past would go quite differently if they lost you. Same goes for losing a loved one and working on bringing them back. So, the boys from Brazil. This movie is one of the weirdest ones I have ever seen and that's a good thing. I think Gregory Peck, you know, the legendary actor, plays Josef Mengele, who managed to clone uh, his old boss a couple of times, and by influencing the clone boy's environment, he's hoping to create someone who'll step up to the role and finish what his old boss started. It's great, you should watch it! <laughs> What I love about it is that somehow the tone is way off, the premise should feel unsettling, but it almost feels like a comedy. Like, who hides a microphone like this? What is this? A cartoon villain setup? It's very camp, that's what I can tell you. If the technology actually existed, which it doesn't, if you didn't catch that and we'll discuss that in detail why in the next chapter, I can imagine bringing a history figure back being a top priority of someone. Michael Jackson allegedly wanted to have his self-clone to carry on his legacy, which is quite dumb. No matter who you want to replicate, it would mean nothing without the experiences that shaped their art or anything. But aside from a person, walls influence the way history goes and gets written. What if you could get an infinitely more powerful army by multiplying your soldiers and become undefeatable? 
Also, do you feel like you don't have enough time to do everything you want or need? Wouldn't it be nice to have a copy of yourself who could do all the tasks you don't want to do? Yeah, sounds awful. A biological replica would have to be genetically identical and have the same past experiences that form the person, right? Nurture versus nature. It's an ongoing debate in psychology whether someone's personality is more influenced by nature, genetic predispositions, what they inherited from their parents, or rather nurture, what they were influenced by growing up, what they were exposed to, the kind of people who raised them. There was a quite infamous experiment in the 60s and 70s where three identical triplets were separated at birth, placed in the care of different families and observed for a while. I don't think I have to go in depth on why this was highly unethical and quite obviously didn't yield any conclusive results. We don't know for certain which one accounts for more, but we do know both are important. In Multiplicity, the protagonist creates copies of himself to gain more time, but each copy ends up having a different personality and they don't exactly want to behave as the original intended. Overanalyzing it, we could say the movie is claiming it's all nature. The first clone has the original's experiences, but has a different personality. In the Black Mirror episode, White Christmas, we meet someone whose work is to create digital replicas of people who think they are alive. This isn't the classic biological clone, but I think it fits. They are basically minds trapped in a computer and are being used as servants to the people they were copied from. We can't say anything of nature versus nurture here. The digital person is an exact copy of the real thing, including all their past experiences and thoughts and has no biology of their own. This is something apparently people like Sam Altman think we'd be able to do very soon and live forever. I fucking... Can we just stop taking everything these fuckwits say and run with it? Watch my video on AI ethics. It's a long one, but in the end I do talk about how Sam and the likes of him want digital people to colonize the universe. I'm not kidding. We're all going to die. We might be able to delay it some more in the future, but it will come for all of us eventually. There are ways to live longer, but you can by no means guarantee it. And one thing by which you can get insurance like no other is keeping a clone of yourself somewhere whose organs would be available on demand when you need them. The island is a very Michael Bay take on this concept. Clones are kept in a facility, told that the outside world is contaminated, and before they are slaughtered, they are told that they'd go live on an island, the last place on Earth, with no contamination. A different one, that focuses more on the human side and not blowing shit up. Young clones learn that they were created for the purpose of having their organs harvested eventually. Don't be naive. You know there would be a market for this. Okay, so all of these are bad. Aren't we trying to control nature? We are somewhat controlling history by doing activism. We want to control our own time and we are for sure trying to control death. And that's the point. We all deal with these thoughts. We want to be able to eat without having to forage or hunt ourselves, to live in a world where we could be happy and free do the things we want and know those we have to, and to do all these for as long as possible. But using human beings, controlling and exploiting them is different. The United Nations defines the right to life and liberty, the right to freedom from slavery and torture as fundamental human rights. But media around cloning revolves around the fact that the given society doesn't consider clones to be people. So that would mean those things wouldn't apply to them? I think this last one, creating humans for the sake of controlling them, is different to the previous ones in that their existence itself is the end goal. Our society agrees that slavery is wrong and therefore a loophole is to not consider them humans because then it's technically not slavery, right? Cloning is only one way of creating them. In Cloud Atlas, for example, they are not implied to be direct copies of anyone. In fact, fabricants, as they are called in that universe, are genetically engineered to be the way they are. In Blade Runner, replicants aren't human. 
they feel and think the way humans do, have desires to live, but aren't strictly biological. I thought a fair amount whether to talk about Blade Runner here because technically they are not copies of anyone, but neither are the clones in Cloud Atlas, so... In pieces like Blade Runner, Cloud Atlas and Star Wars, the fact whether they are clones is secondary. The primary objective is creating people they cannot consider humans, and therefore not have to treat them as such. They are viewed as property. They wouldn't exist without the donors, so they may do with them as they please. They are objects, who happen to be exactly like the rest of us. Whether you want them to replace you or someone you love as organ donors, as disposable soldiers, you assume roles for them even before they were created. At that point, you're not merely trying to control something humans have been trying to since forever, but you use tools for that purpose that actively harm others and turn life into a commodity. These stories are vaguely based on fundamental human desires, but essentially are about lengths we shouldn't go. People whose obsessions make them disregard everything and are willing to use any tools to get what they want. I think it's about time we talk about the reality of the whole thing. First, let's walk through the ethical obstacles when it comes to cloning a human being. Any experiment involving humans has to come after an extensive ethical evaluation. Can you not involve humans? If you have to, what's the level of discomfort they'll have to endure? Is it going to leave lasting effects, physical or psychological? Did they join voluntarily? Will they directly benefit from it? First off, let's just focus on the materials needed for cloning, human eggs. Collecting eggs is a well-established procedure that many people go through. It's an essential part of IVF and it consists of hormone treatments, so multiple eggs are released at once that can be collected during a small surgical procedure. The number is still not that high, so say you can collect an average of 5 from a patient. If you're very good at what you're doing and working with half the failure rate of Dolly the sheep, you will need around 100. 130 to make one clone. To establish a protocol, however, you need to get more than one to work, maybe 10 clones, which is still not very high. The numbers already jumped from 100 to 1000 eggs and hundreds of participants. If you've ever had to do research involving people, then you know likely the hardest part is trying to find participants. If they have to fill out the questionnaire, then that's essentially fine. You'll still have problems, but not as much. But weeks of hormone injections, pills and a surgical procedure, sometimes involving anesthesia, aren't something people tend to do out of the goodness of their hearts. And unfortunately, we live in a world where many share a worldview where those possessing the ability to provide eggs for research are seen as less than. You could very easily run into some big problems. As the failure rate is incredibly high, most embryos are not going to be viable, even if they fully form. They might not survive for long after birth, and even then, we have no idea there could be any long-term complications from this kind of process. This last thing alone would render the whole procedure highly unethical. And at this point I didn't even mention the need for surrogates. Lots and lots of them. But let's say we managed to deal with all that. Cloning a person would mean creating a different person with someone else's traits whose entire existence would be an experiment. When that person is born, scientists, the media, the general public would not leave it at that. They would become a spectacle, something they could not consent to. In 2005, the UN voted majority in favour of the strong oversight of all forms of human cloning. They claimed that by allowing clones to be created, human life would be at risk of becoming a commodity, that the practice would be incompatible with human dignity and the protection of human life. People often cite eugenics as a concern as well. It always comes back to that. They claim that if we allowed cloning human beings, eugenicists would jump to the occasion in attempts to create 
the perfect human being or try to ensure that the population fits their idea. That a few engineered perfect clones at first would be the perfect starting point for a Gattaca scenario to take place. Real attempts at human cloning in reality, however, didn't look like that. Researchers weren't concerned with making identical people. So let's talk about one of the biggest scandals the scientific world has ever seen. Hwang Woo Suk is a South Korean stem cell researcher and veterinarian. He has cloned animals ever since he had been able to get his hands on eggs. At one point he was even hailed as the pride of South Korea for his research until his inevitable downfall due to many of his illegal and madly unscientific practices. What gained him widespread public recognition and later infamy was human therapeutic stem cell cloning. Remember the constant talk around stem cells in the early 2000s and how we'd be able to cure spinal cord injuries that paralyzed people would be able to walk again soon? That was largely because of him. He even personally, publicly promised many of them that. Therapeutic cloning involves taking the DNA from an adult cell of the individual in need of treatment, placing it in the egg and using the embryo to cultivate stem cells capable of turning into any kind of tissue. The same method that's been used to clone Dolly, but here, instead of letting the embryo form, the cells are collected. Stem cells capable of developing into anything would be huge. The immune system recognizes cells alien to the body. People who undergo organ transplants need to take immune suppressors for this exact reason. If we could grow tissues that are genetically identical to the person needing them, there would be no danger of that happening. But you've heard the phrase, if it sounds too good to be true, it likely is. With this kind of research, there are many initial obstacles that are hard to overcome, even one by one, let alone all together. Cloning humans and primates is way more difficult than other animals, but obviously the biggest obstacle is getting eggs in the first place, which is an invasive procedure preceded by weeks of hormonal treatment. The whole thing is quite unpleasant and puts a not insignificant strain on one's body, Wang was adamant that brave women volunteered and that he was incredibly grateful to them, until it turned out that one, several female junior scientists from his staff were called into his office one by one and asked to donate their eggs for his research, which is uh, coercion, and two, he paid money to the rest of the women who participated, which is unethical and illegal. Any kind of research involving participants has to be done on a voluntary basis without bribery. People could be in hard situations and therefore undergo procedures they wouldn't normally if they didn't really need the money. You could, of course, argue that a system that often places people between choices of starvation and working a job that could leave them with serious mental or physical harm is just as unethical, and I would agree with you. These kinds of questions are often put aside when it comes to profit, but research work isn't supposed to be profit-based. Here the goal isn't to make money, but to help people, at least in academia. And so ethical violations are supposed to be taken a lot more seriously. Back when this news broke, he was South Korea's sweetheart and any kind of questions or investigations infuriated his numerous supporters. According to an online poll at the time, 86% of Koreans supported his research and did not consider his collection of eggs unethical. His team published two major papers, one in 2004 and one in 2005, both in highly reputable journals. They claimed that they could create patient-specific cell lines from donors with much higher efficacy using only about 10-20 eggs per patient. If you remember, Dolly was the only surviving embryo out of 277, and this number was largely the norm. People loved him. He got awards, was named Korea's Supreme Scientist. A celebratory stamp was released showing a person from a wheelchair standing up and the journalists who reported his unethical sample collection methods were harassed and threatened. But when their smoke 
that's fire. Scientists all over tried to reproduce his results, all without success. Journalists obtained Huang's samples and tested them only to receive corrupted samples, impossible to analyze. Huang's team and the public claimed that the scientists who could not reproduce his findings were amateurs. The work was already peer-reviewed and how could ever a fraudulent report make it through so many great scientists? In the 2005 paper, they reported 11 patient-specific cell lines. Turns out that none of these ever existed. Pictures of the alleged cell lines were photoshopped. The DNA fingerprinting that showed identical DNA markings were too perfect. Numbers written over to appear better than they were. The whole package. In December of 2006, first several authors retracted their names from the papers following the increasing pressure and later Huang himself admitted that the paper contains some irrecoverable intentional mistakes. He means lies. In the end, both papers were fully retracted. Huang fell from grace, lost his professor title at University of Seoul, and now he works in the Emirates, cloning animals for rich customers, since that's the only thing he verifiably can do quite well. of embryonic stem cells is a sketchy and controversial topic. I personally can understand people who have at least a weird feeling about it. It's a difficult subject, is what I'm saying, and I want to stop there. There's a lot of nuance required, and it's a convenient one to be picked up to portray scientists working with stem cells as insane and morally corrupt. So I want to offer a bit more context. In 2012, Shinya Yamanaka and John B. Gordon won the Nobel Prize for their work on discovering ways to reprogram adult cells into stem cells. With this method, scientists can create so-called induced pluripotent stem cells without the need for embryos, which largely eliminated the need for the controversial material. If you're a fan of Big Bang Theory, good for you, if you are, I'm not judging, it's good if we can find something we like in this hellhole, then you might know it's the method Amy used once to create brain organoids from Sheldon's skin cells. In 2013, though, a year later than Yamanaka and Gordon received the Nobel, a paper was published by researchers demonstrated the first real cloned human embryo to create patient-specific cell lines. The difference between this and Huang Wusok is that this time it looks like they actually did it. Ian Wilmoth himself, the researcher whose lab cloned Dolly in 1996, gave up working with cloning and embryonic stem cells in 2008 and moved on to the Yamanaka method because it's a simpler, more straightforward approach that's not surrounded by a plethora of controversies. When I was writing this script, I watched a Netflix documentary on Wang Gu Sak titled The King of Clones. It was not only very inspirational, but it also reminded me of something. So many scientists fall for this being the first game. Working in research will allow you to be the first at doing or seeing something. It's a weird feeling when you think about it. Quite often that first is just a dot on a screen or a line on a graph. It can be so insubstantial, but no living human has seen that before you. On the other hand, if you're persistent, smart, lucky, hardworking, this first could also get you great recognition and fame. The small thing is a thrill in itself, but some people aren't chasing this small thrill. They are more interested in the big thrill of being popular, being perceived as smart, as a savior, as a legend, even if it means they hold and potentially stop progress that would actually help people, because no one trusts anything anymore that could be associated with the thing they created. Elizabeth Holmes comes to mind, and her company, Theranos. I'm not calling you Liz. I don't care that you're a mother now. There was, and still is, a worry around that biotech companies will have a harder time securing funds for their inventions, but see, I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. If this means big promises will be more thoroughly investigated, people will be more skeptical of scientists tooting their own horns and jumping at every occasion to appear in the media instead of doing the work, then that doesn't necessarily mean people with a more realistic approach will be just as behind. It could be quite the opposite. 
Now, I don't really know how much benefit there could be in therapeutic stem cell cloning. I'd have to ask a stem cell researcher, but one thing is for sure, if it ever comes up again, the circumstances will be very different. I think no one in their right mind would touch that subject without being extremely certain that they can deliver because the opposite would be ruining their reputation very quickly. Anything they say would immediately be under intense scrutiny so they better know what they are talking about. But there's both there, right? It's one thing to falsify data to get a result for your personal gain, but it's a special kind of evil to promise a child paralyzed from the neck down that he'll walk again soon by just lying through your teeth. Just a quick sidetrack. I really enjoy trying to get to the bottom of people's intentions, which can sometimes come across as being sympathetic to the unforgivable, but that's just not the case. I just want to understand their thought process. Knowing how they got from A to Z in their head doesn't mean I'll sympathize with them. And with that being said, if I'm being honest, I think he really thought he was onto something and wanted to get ahead of everyone else by pushing these fraudulent reports. I think he believed it was only a matter of time before these same results became a reality and no one would ever find out about the fabricated data. Which is still lying and horrible scientific practice, of course. You can never know these things in advance, as demonstrated there. Projects are often abandoned, papers never published, data kept in a folder on your computer for years because you can't make any sense of it. And you know what? That's fine. Things don't always work out. That's the biggest, likely most painful reality of being a scientist. Failure is always an option. But if you watch the Netflix documentary about the scandal surrounding him, he makes some super fantastical claims about cloning that I think say a lot about his character. He was recently involved in an attempt to clone the woolly mammoth, the extinction, you know, and said on camera that he thinks these animals will unify the two Koreas once again. He appears to not regret anything besides the things that caused his downfall, mainly them being made public, and still believes his work only would have needed a slight nudge in the right direction and all his claims would have become a reality. He clearly believes he is destined to do something great, whether it be curing spinal cord injuries or solving a near century long geographical conflict. Therapeutic stem cell cloning itself remains a controversial field. Whether there was any viability to Wang's claims that they were able to develop the basics needed, we'll never know. And personally, I don't care. He should stay put and not touch anything with a potential scientific value ever again. Ugh, I should say something positive to here in the end. Ugh. I sometimes worry that by talking about this I get people to not trust science and scientists as much, but then I remember that smart people and those I want as my audience will understand where I'm coming from. So, concluding notes. When something's too good to be true, it is. When someone wants you to talk about them and not what they are doing, they have ulterior motives. Same goes for not providing nuance. Complicated subjects are exactly that. Complicated. I think that's enough for now. Bye!